Welcome to Around the Reel with your hosts, Aaron Carlson, Charles Lawson, and Samantha Hanna. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. So yeah, we just started going, I guess, okay. then. So let's go. Yeah, well, welcome to Around the Reel, everybody. Good evening. Hello. On yeah. the evening edition of Around the Reel. Yes. Yes, here we are, during the week. Yeah. Holy shit, we only usually do this on the Saturday mornings. I know, really, really early, you know, like 10.30 yeah. and stuff. Now, Brian, check this out. He, this is. A, <laughs> I don't get coffee. I get this tonight. That's that's good. Man, I shit. have coffee, but mine's definitely spiked. <laughs> that, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> what? Yeah. I, I have, think I need a drink here too. Actually, I don't blame I, you. I have water, so I'll stay. You want us to give you a minute so you can go make? Yeah, one? we can no, start no, it's going. Right. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I don't know where to track any down. I'm sitting in my office. Oh, you know, dang. And, okay. So <laughs> good. We'll yeah, uh, we'll drink some for you. <laughs> there, there must be some alcohol here in the office somewhere. I just don't know where it is right now. Well, oh, if you darn need it. some, are you left-handed or right-handed? <laughs> I am right-handed. Check your left drawer. Wow. <laughs> I don't okay. have any money. <laughs> What's that mean? If Somebody else might have. If you're right-handed, yeah, you're going to keep all the crap that you really want to pay attention to in your left-hand drawer. You don't keep it on your right hand drawer because your right hand's always doing stuff. So your left hand drawer is what you. Where do you uh, find these rules? How do you even know this? He thinks outside I the box. I study humans. You don't study that kind of human behavior. What the hell is that? <laughs> you're right handed, so you're going to put all your shit over here that you that you don't need. Is that what you said? No, all the stuff that's essential to you is going to be in your left hand drawer. This, but you're right handed. Why the fuck would you put it on the left side? This is what's in Chuck's left hand drawer. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of creepy. I know stuff- that was backwards, but you can get the hint. All right, but she just brought that to me, by the way, so I could look I at it because they've already it read gift. it cover to cover. That's weird. <laughs> okay, you guys don't have to explain yourself. <laughs> oh, I enjoy, heard something. We I want you to explain yourself, myself. though. We yes. want to get to know you. Well, let's let's okay. tell the audience who we got here. This is Brian Wynn. He's a filmmaker and a director down in L.A. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having absolutely. me. Absolutely, absolutely, man. Um, I've been following. Brian's movie for quite a while. A long time. Yeah. And it's it's actually a really good film that he created and I I loved watching it and the weird thing about his movie that got me and we'll get into more of it in a little bit that it was it reminded me of what we made with our okay. outrider. It just it's a little coincided lighter. at the same yeah. time. So yeah, yeah. we had a blast. But Brian, please tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Where are you from, man? So I am from, well, I guess I would originally came from, well, L.A. I was born here, and then I left here for quite some time and went up to Northern California, lived up there for a while, and then left in Modesto for a number of years. That's where George Lucas kind of grew up, and then uh, moved down here, I think. Uh, it's been a long time, probably almost 20 years now I've been back down here. Gotcha. So, um, But, uh, yeah, my, my career as a filmmaker has been kind of scattershot. I... Uh, I worked in television up north in Northern California. I did commercials and uh, industrial films and short films when I could. And then um, pretty much anything, anytime I could get, uh, you know, any equipment available to me, I would like go try to make something or whatever. I did that for a number of years, um, you know, with my friends or whatever. And as we got going along, we had better equipment, better locations, more resources. So the product, gradually got better Mm -hmm. and then i moved to la i think it was i'm dating myself now but it was around 1999 i came down here to um because i had done most of my undergrad work at a place called stanislaus state in turlock california which is a kind of a cow town agricultural town outside of modesto that didn't have any kind of film program as what i do is i would uh i hit up the professors to just do independent study projects and i just make movies for my project my whole course would just be making a movie on my own so i get credit for that and then when i had enough units i wanted to actually get a degree in film so i came moved back down here uh to la and went to cal state university northridge where i finished my film um degree in like one year i did like 40 42 units i think but it really gave me a good good opportunity to um experience the business firsthand because as soon as i got to cal state university northridge i was able to get an internship at paramount and then that summer i was able to work for a producer um an academy award-winning producer named scott rudin for a whole summer and then i was able to work at 20th century fox and that was at the time they were making a place called new regency and they had they were making fight club at the time they had just finished fight club 
and they had made Heat and L.A. Confidential, which were, you know, some of my favorite films of all time. Oh, yeah. So I got to work there for a while, and then I kind of got into the nitty-gritty of the business itself. I worked at a couple of um, agencies. I worked at a place called Mosaic Media Group where we were representing and developing projects for, like, Will Ferrell and Vince Vaughn and Jim Carrey. So I did that for a little bit, um, and then I just kind of got really disillusioned by the business side of things and realized I wasn't making anything anymore. I was just working for other people and working in really offices, and I didn't want to be doing that. I wanted to be on set doing things. And I realized the cost of time that I would spend trying to work myself into a position where I could actually make my own things was going to be, you know, prohibitive and I felt, I felt like I would take years doing something I didn't want to do sure. to try to do something I wanted to do and what I really missed actually was like making movies with my friends which is funny it's like the thing you miss when you're actually in the business is like I miss having the control to just go do and make something right. but I wasn't doing that at all anymore so um, I decided well if I'm just going to work in an office then I might as well just go get a job that has nothing to do with the film business because I, I was so disillusioned at the time Mm-hmm. And I figured I'd just take a job, get a job to make a living. So four years out of Hollywood, I, uh, well, I had spent four years there. I decided to go to law school. Um, I did that and then graduated from law school and started working in law for about, uh, I don't know, probably, geez, probably seven or eight years. Okay. And then I was like, I really wanted to go back to making movies again while I was actually uh practicing law so um what happened was there was a film contest that came across um my desk one day and i was like you know what i i could enter this it's like one of those 30 day challenges and i thought well we could we could do this and one of my colleagues actually uh used to be an actor well he is an actor but he uh had done a lot of tv work he was on uh, star trek next generation for a number of episodes and Um, he had done a lot of film work back in the early nineties and late nineties. And, and then he was itching to try to, you know, do some work with me. So we started making a, we did a short film together and then I did another short film. And then about, I don't know, I guess it was three years ago. Um, I was like, well, it's time to make a feature, you know, let's just make a feature because that's something I always wanted to do. So I, uh, gathered all my resources, you know, very Robert Rodriguez style, and just was like, okay, here's what we got. Let's go make a movie. And then I just gathered all the people who I had worked with on shorts over the past few years and, um, you know, started writing a script where I could really use all of their uh, talents, Mm -hmm. you know, and um, we just pulled it together and shot it, shot a movie. It was called Thieves. It's very guerrilla style. And uh, we just shot it all around L.A. I tried to use as many locations from movies that i like just because i'm such a huge fan of sure. like heat and stuff like that right, and drive right, right. kinds of fil- films so so i say well we can we can get those locations we don't obviously can't pay for them but we can probably get some of them so we did we did get a number of those locations and uh that was a lot of fun so you uh, actually it, so you were stealing shots is what you're telling yeah, yeah the whole, <laughs> oh the whole my movie, god we don't the whole movie was stealing. like well you know it's always yeah, like, we hmm. definitely know. I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not, I, it's not really, uh, you know, permit friendly, you know, and it sure. just takes too much time to do all that. So. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, so my theory is always like, if you can get the shot before you get kicked out, then you'll probably get the shot and right. then you'll get kicked that's, out. Right? And some, could, some of the do. shots that's you get while you're getting kicked out work really well too. <laughs> that's exactly, actually, yeah. yeah. You use <laughs> just get don't don't just you still you still can't get the mic in there. Just got to make sure you keep that mic yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, that was that was funny because we had um, a scene at uh, Bob's Big Boy in Burbank, and that was a right. famous location in Heat where they go before the big heist to pick up. Uh, What's his name? What's his name? Um, uh, the guy from the commercials. Now I can't even think of his yeah, name. Yeah, he's know. Turo. No, no. The, the, uh, oh, uh, African American gentleman uh, who yeah. plays the Allstate commercials. Yeah, now. the guy that kills me oh, in the yeah. fucking kitchen when she says I'm proud of you, and he goes, "What the fuck are you proud of me for?" That guy yeah. that, that kills me every fucking time <laughs> he says that line. Uh, I cannot. Yeah. I can't get through it without crying. Yeah, I, I can't think of his name, but he's an amazing actor. Dennis oh. Haber. Dennis hey, Haber. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank That's you. it. So yeah. Dennis Haber. Uh, it, that's the scene where they pick him up and say, hey, you know, Danny Trejo just basically bailed on us. We need a getaway driver. Right. And anyway, so you're, we were shooting the there. Guy. So he got the film there. So that's great, man. So so we filmed there, and to your point, we couldn't really use the boom, so we just like kind of hid the mic under the table and had to shoot outside. But we were able to get enough takes to where it was like nobody noticed what we were right. doing. And we went around the back and 
shot a whole like walk and talk scene with nobody really noticing. Yep. And, you know, as long as you don't carry a big footprint and a lot of tra- uh, equipment, people yeah. think you're probably just shooting a YouTube video. YouTube video. Right. That's my philosophy. Yep. That's how, crew, yeah. Tiny. Thank God for that. Or TikTok. Everybody's, everybody's <laughs> got a camera these days, so they, they're not mm-hmm. going to be the wiser. Especially no, if they the don't. Camera. Yeah. Yep. It's nothing new. Well, it's it's amazing when you can put something together like you did. I mean, like, I mean, when we did it, we couldn't believe what we were able to accomplish. But we didn't have to do too many of those kind of shoots. We had the luxury of asking, and we got locations yeah. for free. So we, we were pretty lucky. lucky. But there were a few. Yeah. You know, like I've said yeah. before on the podcast, we had a hard time with, with getting a church. Fucking churches, man. Yeah. It, well, they <laughs> frown brutal. upon, you know, you making a movie about... They didn't when they, they made Exorcist. <laughs> they could give two shits when they're making well, that because they had a lot of money. I, they probably um, built that church, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say the <clears throat> half of the movie was probably locations that we actually had access to, and but all the outdoor locations are pretty much stuff that we stole from. Yeah, yeah. Well, so and that, that's kind of what you have to do when yeah. you, yeah. I mean, especially big locations when we're doing chases through the streets. I mean, nobody really noticed us downtown, right? I mean, it was funny. We were shooting a a shootout scene like down in the L.A. riverbed, and literally, like the police helicopters take off from like 500 yards away from there. And, Flying over us, and, and nobody said anything. Yeah, no one's going to say yeah. a word. So they, they won't unless you're de- walking down the street carrying, like, big-ass guns. Yeah, that like we did. did. <laughs> the question is, did you get the shot of the helicopters taken off? That's the important question. I, I did. Yeah, he I did. In the movie. Yeah, I he's did. got them in there. Mm-hmm. Um, what was I going to say? Was well, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Why well, you think I of think. yours. Yes. Um, I was wondering what brought you to want to do it in black and white. Um. I was really inspired by, well, two things. I thought that um, if we were, well, like three things, I should say. I wanted to kind of uh, mimic, I guess, or I was inspired by the film, Stanley Kubrick's film, The Killing, and then also a film that John Huston did called The Asphalt Jungle. And I was mm-hmm. thinking, stylist, stylistically speaking, um, I was going to shoot in a very low-budget manner where kind of the way they used to shoot you know, all these interiors at the studio and all that. And I thought maybe it would have that kind of feel sure. because we weren't going to have a lot of money. So I looked at it like, okay, so even for something like the killing, there's a lot of interiors. There's not very much action outside. I thought we could mimic that on, on a scale like we're doing today. And obviously on a very low budget where right. back then it probably cost them more money to do that. But I thought that's basically what I was going for. So it was an homage to the noir of the day and also, mm-hmm. Doing, I thought it would be cool to have the mix of doing something modern in black and white, but also having, because I wanted to have a very John Carpenter 80s score. And I thought there's not a lot of movies that have black and white and an 80s kind of right. edge and all that. And some people, you know, didn't get that, but I, that was my I thing. Got I, I got it. I got it. I grew up on uh, like Miami Vice. So for me. That's him too. That, Aaron yeah. and Brian, you guys must be each other's biggest fans. <laughs> That's what I'm I know. telling you. So when <laughs> I watched this movie, I knew Twin exactly soul. what he was doing. I got yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Because I, yeah, I know so it. You get it. Yeah. You got totally you right got off the bat. Yeah. Absolutely. I, totally. So, but I mean, you were able to pull it off. I mean, I am not like as big of a movie fan as Aaron is and I watched your movie and it was great it was beautiful oh, it was shot you. really well yeah. it was really good yeah. it was really good as a matter of fact I almost envied the fact that you were able to make it so bright we had we struggled with lighting some of yeah. ours some of ours is pretty dark at times where I wish we could have brightened it up a little better but you were yeah. in a good location to for using natural light right well so, our story well, too though. well and you know what actually I wrote it all to take place during the day for the most part right. yeah, I knew it wasn't going to have time to, to really light things and I knew that would be an issue mm-hmm. so yeah. for the stuff that I did at night I was like very particular but and really a lot of it was just the light sources I had available I think there was only one scene where I pulled out some lights and actually lit it oh, right. wow. and that was one but the rest wow. of it was uh, during the day and I did that on purpose because I knew I didn't want to spend time lighting things I figure if I'm shooting on the middle of the day I won't need to light anything right exactly. plus with a low budget you don't really yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're not, not as confident time. with the lighting you don't have, you don't have time I knew I yeah. could get decent <laughs> composition images and whatnot, but I knew I didn't have time to really light like three point lighting and all I just didn't sure. have time to do that see we didn't even so. do that we no. said fuck it let's get a hard light and just light. blow it the yeah. fuck up because it was well, in black and white well, yeah I mean the thing is when you're doing a noir too you can get away with kind of maybe yes. using one line because you use the, sh- the, the shadows and stuff yeah yeah the, the shadows because it's right. very and that's kind of what they did back in the day mm-hmm. with the, the noir film so i feel like yeah we're totally just kind of stealing from that style which yeah. is cool you it's, know? And if you get cool. it's that, beautiful unfortunately not everybody sees that and a lot yeah. of people are like 
because it's black and white, they don't even give it a chance. But yeah, for me, that, no, it, that's yeah. true. That was going to be one of the questions I asked him too. Mm-hmm. So when you've had some of the audience that you've had, because I know you've got a lot of people that watched your movie now, did you get yeah. any of that too? Because we got a lot of that. Where um, you, you know, know what? Not as much as I thought. I think if no, people are into starting to watch it and then they know what they're in for and then you know basically they're in i think i had one reviewer say i just wish there was a color version of this correct um but other than that i mean it wasn't a total knock on it they just thought well, what, what would a color version of this look like right but for the people that watched it most of them just judged it based on whether they liked the story or not like, yeah. yeah how they felt about it well and the thing and that good, the thing that you were able to do which actually was inspiring was that you were able to make it not seem black and white your story you know it kind of grabs you to where you don't even notice it's in black and white which is exactly yeah. what you're so supposed they, to mm-hmm. yes do yes, with that thank yeah you, thank you well well and i i think too that um with anything i mean um i know obviously we want to make beautiful pictures and everything else but when you're doing a low budget movie really the story's got to work and people will forgive a lot if they're into the story you know exactly. I really think that's really yeah. key the As story is know. the most important thing well, most about important it. Thing. and people spend so much time on like oh, i gotta get the right camera i gotta get the right light set up and it's like if the story's not there i don't care yeah. how much you spent yeah. setting this it doesn't up. matter Just because it looks good people are going to tune out right. I mean, we know that right. we go to bad movies all the time that cost like 50 million dollars don't we we're like bored. <laughs> i know, <laughs> you know? No, i'm so totally with you yeah. 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 So tell us what what is uh in briefly what is Thieves about so people know what that movie is um, so, about. So Thieves is really kind of a throwback to the films I kind of I grew up with like um I guess going back to like I was saying The Killing or Asphalt Jungle kind of those and then also kind of inspired by like a lot of Soderbergh stuff like mm-hmm. Ocean's Eleven, um, even Out of Sight, and even going even further Great back movie. to like The Underneath, which is a little known heist film that he did in like 1995 that really kind of spun his career around because he was really in a dark place. Mm-hmm. But I like that movie. I like the grittiness of it and sure. stuff like that. Really, when I was coming up, those are the kind of movies I really wanted to make. This is kind of the movie I, I wanted to make for a long time. Yeah. I was just like, this is something that um, I felt like I had to do. You know Good for mean? you. So basically, yeah, it's about a group of thieves who. Uh, plan to take down a uh, racetrack, which is Santa Anita racetrack. Um, and, of course, you know, uh, there's a lot of double crosses and triple crosses. And and what I tried to do is I know a lot of people are wise to those kinds of films and kind of they expect the twist to be coming. So I tried to twist it around even a little more to maybe you wouldn't see the ending coming. I didn't so, see it. I didn't I see did, it either. I didn't see it coming. Yeah. I didn't and, see it coming. And that was a great, a great uh, good. climax to the story. Yeah. Um, what I did like a lot, and I know you, when you were on another podcast I was listening, you were talked about the getting the racetrack and, and filming those things there. So we're talking yeah. about he actually filmed at a horse racetrack where these horses are running around and it gave the movie more of an epic feel. It felt Definitely. like he was really, you know, yeah. that this is a bigger budget movie. Did you just get by, the okay right. for that? Or was no, that no, no, one fucking didn't. didn't. <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking like, okay. great. That's awesome. I did, I did not. Okay. Uh, what happened was I had a, a contact, one of my uh, the lawyers I work with, he used to have a horse that he raced out there. Mm. He had a guy he knew at the track. He says, call him. So I called the guy, and the guy was just like, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, uh, you know, racetrack movie. It's a, you know, a heist movie. They're going to come in, and he's racing you know, steal from the racetrack. He's like, no, I don't think we'd want to do that kind of movie. I know if I was calling and I was HBO and I had Michael Mann, right. like, they, oh, fuck. they'd be like, <laughs> they'd okay, be what day do you want to come by? There. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, so I'm like, okay, I get it. I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm, right. I'm not Michael Mann. So he was just like flat out no. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to go anyway. So was, what I did is – My camera was so small, I basically just had it in the camera bag, and I knew I was just going to use, I wasn't going to need sound. I would pick up whatever sound I could get from the camera. Mm -hmm. So when I walked into the racetrack, it was like the security guard, like, checked my bag and everything, and he's just like, oh, you're just going to get some shots of the horses today? It's like I was a spectator. Boom. And I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, absolutely. So, and then what we did is I went in with (laughs) my lead uh, actor, and I said, I'm just going to follow you around with the camera. We just got these great handheld kind of almost steady cam looking shots and you then got we got great, great shots great shots of the of the actual horses and that's what i really wanted i was like yeah. th- for this to really work you've got to you really got to see the horses you got to get the feeling of the track it's got to feel like we really did this you can't just right. fake it all so, so when it comes to stolen shots well I, this is what i really want to know from you because you did that but um when hey, it comes we to did stolen, it too you well, could no, ask me we did it but we didn't with other people oh in okay it. sorry i'll say it so that's the question i have for you because how does that 
um, work with other when you have other people in those shots? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I mean, technically, we're supposed to get waivers and whatnot. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a lawyer, and I don't specialize in uh, <laughs> entertainment law, but I do know you're supposed to get waivers. But yeah. for the most part, uh, you know, if somebody complains about it or somebody sees it, which is a long shot on a movie like yeah. this, yeah. then certainly I would uh, deal with that situation and, you know, pay them whatever they needed. Ooh, but ooh. I don't think it's really going to – that's the thing. When you're taking risks on a movie like this, there are things you wouldn't do on a bigger movie right. just because it would cost too much. But on a movie like this, I'm willing to take those kind of risks. You're and, just kind of flying under the cover, like hoping mm-hmm. – exactly, hey, Or under exactly. the radar, I'm sorry. Under yeah. the cover. And, I, mean, I don't know, <laughs> but it was very identifiable. And if they were, I could guess I haven't heard anything from them. Certainly, it's been out for a while. So, no, so yeah, fine. those are the – those are the kind of risks that, like I said, I would take that are kind of inherent in this kind of filmmaking process. Yeah. But mm-hmm. if I had, you know, more money, obviously I oh, would do yeah. it the right way and get the Definitely. permit, oh, which I'm going to do on the next thing. So. Yeah, but mm-hmm. if you're if you're if we're a lot alike here, Brian, which I feel like we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you do you see yourself as a filmmaker wanting to have that bigger budget? Can you see yourself managing that kind of funds and doing everything and feeling good about yourself, or would it change it for you? I think it would. I think a lot of filmmakers feel that way because I know I've seen movies that I thought, well, when they didn't have any money, I thought that was their best movie. Like uh, Kevin Smith, I think his best movie is still Clerks, even Clerks though he great. has <laughs> yeah. all these other movies. Yeah. And you can tell as he got even, and, and even he said, it's like the further he got away from that when he's trying to make a movie about uh, people with no money. Right. Uh, it, he couldn't, it, it didn't have the same feel to him because mm-hmm. he was just too distant from that. Yeah. You know it doesn't I mean? have yeah. the same feel. And he still fights no, that to no, this day. No, it wasn't genuine it. anymore. No. It yeah. wasn't just in his buddy. Yeah. So I, I get that point. But you know what? I, I don't, I mean, uh, I feel like um, uh, if I can get, you know, even a few movies, I would definitely like to have one movie that I could get that kind of money for and have the trucks sure. and all that just to see how it feels. See how it feels. To actually be, it's like, okay, here's a good, a good example. So my lead actor, um, uh, Dakota Kennedy, he's great. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he calls me up the other day and he says, Hey, I, I just got on this. Uh, he, he moved to Oklahoma early this year. And he's like, I just got on this movie, this Dennis Quaid movie. And it's a, uh, about Ronald Reagan and the assassination and all that. And Quaid is playing the president Reagan and, and uh, oh, John shit. Boyd's in it, and he's That's but, cool. he, but he's like, you know, it's like a twenty-five million dollar movie, and it was funny because he goes, so I go there for the fitting, and they're like, oh, you, you can, we're, we we don't need you yet. You can go to your trailer, and he's like, I got it, I got a trailer. This is crazy. <laughs> he's so he's like an extra, and, he, and he, yeah, and, well, he's got shit. he's got he's got one line. He's like the Secret Service agent. Okay, goes to, awesome. Nancy, goes to Nancy and tells mm-hmm. her what happened to the president. You know. Uh, Penelope Ann Miller plays Nancy Reagan, but anyway, so he uh, he's 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 like Instagramming and showing me his trailer, and he's like, it's "Cool, you know, I'm just here for the fitting." And they got right. my trailer, and then he goes back to actually shoot the next day, and he's like, "No, this trailer's even better. That was just a temporary trailer," and he's like <laughs> blown away by this, you know, because he's got this huge trailer. And, and then, then he was telling me. He goes, but even on a movie like this, it's funny because they still tell you to bring your own shoes and bring your own shirt. Bring your own shit. Right. Bring your own <laughs> shit when you come here. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dude, that's so, so funny. Even, no matter how big you get, there's still a little bit of like low budgetness. It's still too. ghetto in there once in a while. Yeah, it's still a little yeah. bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> we'll give so, you the jacket, um, bring your own dress shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like bring your own dress shirt. That's what it was, dude. So. That's <laughs> funny. And then you get your man back on another movie you make, and he's like, "Dude, where's my fucking trailer, man?" I know. Well, that's yeah. what he said. He's <laughs> like, I said, I guess on the next movie we're gonna have to have a trailer. No shit. To- you're like, sit in the fucking chair, eat a corn dog, shut the fuck up. <laughs> you better start saving. You better start saving for that trailer. Dude, I'm just gonna a little matchbox trailer. Get put it in his hand. Here you go. So funny. Here you, go. you know, I'm I'm coming around. I I think I confuse the money thing though with like spending it on all this extravagant stuff, which I always find it more fun to try to make that happen without having the money, right? But I would well, like I, to have I, the money to to give to like people to help me make it. You know, I pay yes. for the composer or a visual visual effects artist or you know a cinematographer, so we don't have to do that ourselves. That kind of thing, I'm no problem with. But it's like, do I really want to spend a lot of fucking money? And and get that location when we can go steal a shot somewhere. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I mean, I'm thinking this movie costs 25 million. How much are the trailers? How much is all the food? How much is all that? You know? Yeah, man. Because that stuff doesn't get on the screen. That's very much like you know everybody gets taken care of. But, yeah. But at what cost? You know? I mean, right. for yeah, 25, exactly. For 25 million dollars, I could make. 
25 great movies, you know? Dude, and, and, he's, yeah. Oh, yeah. God, man. I could make more so, of that. Anyway. It's like <laughs> there's kind of, there's you know kind I mean? of this you. spot that you want to be at where you don't want to go all the way because that takes the magic out of it. And then yeah. you, there's something lost there. But you want to have more money to do more things. Yeah. But you just don't want to, yeah. You got so to balance, that, that, balance that it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> you want to stay in there. It would be nice to have money to pay for location. Definitely. For sure. 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 Just, 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 just give me the money. I'll figure it out. Yeah, you can have the money, Chuck. I don't want to <laughs> do it. I'll nice. figure it out. I mean, it's nice to be able to hire some, some name actors if I yeah. want. Yes, to that kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I think that. that it's like um, like Christopher Nolan said, if you start doing the stuff yourself and you just start a precedent of always doing this stuff yourself, writing your own stories, right. making your own movies, it'll always be your path. And that's kind of amazing that he's making like interstellar and inception yeah. and tenant now mm-hmm. that are his original scripts, but they're spending $200 million on there's nobody really other than Quentin Tarantino that gets to do that kind of thing. Correct. Right. Where, yeah. you know, without saying it's a, you know, a uh, part of a, a superhero franchise or something like that. They're not yeah, going to spend or his name Spielberg. Anything, right? Right? Who's still well, is because, underneath it. Yeah. I well, get it. Because yeah. your story. Like yeah, exactly. We're there talking about independently. Lot. Yeah, crafted artists like this. They come in and they take over and they want you to do, put this aspect and that aspect Mm -hmm. and they change your stuff and make it theirs. Well, and I used to see that when I worked in Hollywood and I hated it. It was like filmed by committee by a bunch of people that, that's what annoyed me the most is it was people that really didn't even know movies. And I would be like, this director or that director. And they'd be like, who? And I'd be like, "Mm, what the fuck? Why am I here? Like, you guys are all just just here to like have lunches with people and have phone calls and go out for drinks. Yeah. I'm not here for that. I How do make- you work in Hollywood and not know fucking movies? They don't. They don't. A lot of <laughs> yeah. get that not. shit. I, I don't, that no, doesn't Ke- make any that's sense That's what kind of Kevin was talking about, about his music, was people come in and not appreciate what the he was art, doing, yeah. the, the art of the what craft, he was doing. The craft of what and you're, we're working on, because they don't the get import- it. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah I don't and that when it comes to that, I think you kind of, you lose. You don't, you don't even win when you're when it's like no, that because it's no, about I, your it, art and your and, ideas and I'll, I'll tell you something else like i used to see guys the writers with great scripts and they would just get so pushed around and calls not returned and you know executives kind of jerking them along saying mm-hmm. oh yeah i loved your script and then be like yeah i don't want to return that guy's call anymore it's like and it would take years and years and years in development and options and all this stuff before that script maybe ever got made if it did and i just was like why would i spend 10 years i mean in two years i could probably write something granted on a lower budget i wouldn't have sure. a studio with me but right. i could probably raise the money myself or just go make it myself for nothing right as opposed to it's better to have a low budget movie than no movie at all that's what yeah, i'm saying exactly. just, you know what i mean that's kind of the way i used to look at it so yeah plus you get know. your story out there it's a way to get exactly it out yeah. there. And, and it can lead to other things and, yeah. and i'll tell sure. you just having one and you probably experienced this too aaron it's like once you have your movie on Amazon, I mean, granted, it's the path to Amazon is not that hard, but sure. I'm just saying when people actually see it, people don't know what we do to get it on Amazon. Mm-hmm. They're like, That's if they the see it thing. on there, they see it with all these other big movies, and all of a sudden it kind of legitimizes you in a way that they That's take right. you seriously. And all of a sudden they're like talking to you like you're a director, and it's right. like, oh, hey, I want to do this, I want to do that, and we can get money for this. So it changes everything it changes the game. Yeah. but yeah. at yeah. the same time they big time judge you based on that too yeah like they are harsh on their judgments yeah of, yes of, their expectations yeah. are huge but that's yes. okay because that drives us anyway you know what yeah. I mean? And that's yeah. why we do it. I want to be better every time. I don't even need them to tell me that. So now that they expect it, I'm like, Nick, you just caught up. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. how I feel. I've already seen myself. I see my movies in my head. I know when we're doing it and we're all working together to try to make it happen. 90% of what we shoot. I shouldn't say 90, maybe 70% of what we shoot. It's not in my brain. I just know that's what we're capable of right now, you know? Sure. But when, yeah, when, when you visualize that story, when you're actually sitting down on that, that keyboard and you're writing that screenplay, I see fucking epic stuff, you know? And then you get on set and you realize, well, how do we tell it? How do we do it? Without and all you know the money. what? It's fucking great yeah. still. <laughs> it's that, so the, much fun to yeah. pull off and try. And then you look at what you did and you're like, want to cry about it. Like, look what we did, man. Yeah. Is, is it like what you thought, Aaron? No, but it's still fucking great. The, crap, the crappy <laughs> thing is that you, you can't feel. actually tell your story in that way because once you make it and Hollywood backs you, you lose 
like they then have control over what you do. So it changes In your the, story. So yeah. it's not like, yeah. like you were saying, you know, about someone who's able to actually tell their story and not have someone boss yeah. them around. That's actually amazing because it's almost like unheard of. Well, they're, they're going to hire. Like, they're going to hire you on anyway. That's the thing for some project here. We're going to hire Aaron to direct this movie, and I'm going to direct some film that. You know, it's not my thing. Well, and know? I think those guys at this point have enough money to back themselves. So well, there's like, a couple guys, to... like he said, like Quentin Carantino and yeah, Christopher exactly. Nolan. Those guys they... can make their own shit. Right. And these these production companies and everything else are going to get their back because they've already seen the, the dollar amount they're going to get back for just backing Absolutely. this guy. Right. So he can do exactly. what he wants. He can do whatever he wants. But there was a time of proving themselves, too, even. Absolutely. Like, there and was you know a what? Time and and Christopher Nolan's way. movies were badass then. <laughs> but he had yeah. to yeah. consistently do that before he actually had that yeah. leeway. Well, think how, think, well like, look back at Reservoir Dogs, how fucking badass that movie is. I still think Reservoir Dogs is his best His movie. fucking best yeah. movie, right? Yeah. 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 You know, and even when he moved into Pulp Fiction, it still felt the same, like that low yeah. indie yeah. feel. And yeah, he had more money, but still, it's like fucking I'm more money like, and a little bit bigger names. Yeah, yeah but no, I do like true. that he kept that. I do. I like that, that he kept that, that feel yeah. to it, yeah. that yeah. low budget yeah. or smaller budget feel. Yeah. But he yeah. did make yeah. it. Yeah, and it's it was a beautiful movie. Was. It was only like an eight million dollar movie, which is nothing. It's now. nothing. Well, now. yeah, yeah, you know, and that's that's what I'm saying, man. Plus, it's, that's a guy right there that appreciates the the lower budget stuff and appreciates right. the feel of that, and kind of he tries to keep it when he does his work, which I love. How long did it take you to write Thieves? You wrote it, right? I wrote it. Yeah, okay. uh, I would say probably because I think. When I sat down, I knew it was going to be a lot like The Killing. That was really my inspiration. Yeah. So, and I had just rewatched it, and I was like, somebody should update this and kind of make a new right. version of it. And that's kind of – but I guess it took me about six months. But okay. kind of – I mean, I, I kind of have an idea of the beginning, middle, and end. And sometimes it's like another movie, but then it all changes. You know right. what I mean? It's kind of, but I have at least a guide or an idea of something in my head that I've seen that maybe inspired me. And then as I go, it all changes. But I feel like there's – Always a jumping off point that of inspiration that yeah. gets me going. Well, and I, I think have that... to go watch that movie because I'm kind of lost no, at it's... this point. Like, I'm a <laughs> oh, little lost right now. It's... I need to go watch that one. Well, well, and that's what I love about like Christopher Nolan's The Following, which was black and white, yeah. like a sixteen thousand dollar movie. Okay, and like I would watch interviews with him, and he would just say, "Hey, it took me like you know." three years to make this and I would just go out with my friends on the weekends and we'd just go shoot this go thing. Go shoot the movie. You know what I mean? And yeah, it was like, what to do. And he's like, we shot in black and white because we just wanted some consistency because there's no way we're going to be able to light this thing and make it look like anything that's, decent. So, yeah. so I was like... Don't tell anybody, just, but we did black yeah. and white to harder hide our flaws. That's exactly because well, we that's didn't have all the... Yeah. did the same. <laughs> and, he, and even the idea of go shoot somebody next to a window so you don't have to put up a light like he would do that and yeah. i'd be like that's awesome and then we yeah. tried to do that too yeah, yeah. we just put near a light source and uh or natural light and he said that that kind of stuff would translate even to like the dark night he said he's shooting it all still with one camera just like he was as a low budget filmmaker right and still shooting the same way and still shooting every insert and second unit and all that himself with right his dp so i think that Going back to kind of what you were saying about having the bigger budgets, I think if if you're always used to doing it on your own, I think if you can um, maintain some of that, not always, but I think if you can maintain some of that, um, then it's it's really powerful because you know you can write your own ticket. You right. know what I mean? You well, the movie can't. the movie is an expression of who you are as a as a writer as a director. I mean, I realized that after we did one of our experimental movies um, in 2017 where I actually watched the movie again and it's, it's horrible. Right. But at the same time, it was a lot of fun to do and it was a cool story, but we weren't ready for that kind of movie yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it man, did that escalate us. It escalated us quick, you know, yeah. just watching it and seeing, Oh my God, how horrible of an edit it is and the acting we did and the color grading, all that shit was bad. Well, but it pushes you. To yeah, it does. But the thing I learned was, Holy shit, that is me. Every character in that movie was one of my fucking emotions, Brian. Yeah. It was yeah. crazy when I watched it. And I'm like, I wrote the thing. We had talked about making this movie five, six, seven years. We would film in the beginning. We took a break. We never went back. Then we finally go back. We finished this thing. I had to rewrite it and do a time jump because we all look fucking older now. Well, no, tell him the truth <laughs> about the movie. This others. movie, when he when he pitched me the story. <laughs> oh, God, here we go. I'm going to tell you. Fine. When he pitched me the story, I don't like acting at all. I yeah. only do it because I love Aaron I'm, and I support his dreams. So I, I don't like it, though. I don't. 
So this one story you pitched me, though, I loved. I fell in love with the story immediately. I fell in love with the character. Mm -hmm. And we started it. And then we stopped. And then years and years and years passed. And I bugged him every all the time, constantly. Can we at least finish that movie, please, please? And finally, after like, I don't know, how long was it? It took about five years. Five Five years. years. Five Five years years later, he finally listened to me. And we actually finished the movie. But I loved the story. I just it got me. Yeah, I no, loved it. And Brian yeah. would get it, and he would like it because it is a crime story. It was my oh, good, yeah. it was my Goodfellas mixed with a little bit of uh, what's a slapstick crime movie we got? What was a good one back in the day? You guys, come on! Don't put slapstick in there. It was you know the fun <laughs> stuff where it's goofy, but it's still badass. Oh, God. it's it's like every know. single eighties knockoff style of that. Aaron don't, definitely don't fuck is an eighties. Right He's now. an eighties no, guy. I'm not, no, 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 not just an eighties. No, I'm just saying it's, it was everything that had to do that. I mean, it was you know, kind it was of. called the con, a crime ballad. I mean, that was the whole point. Was the fact that it yeah. was it was a it was, it was a he was paying homage to everything. Well, he it, always it, it, and it Miami Vice always has yeah, bro. something. Okay, so <laughs> to do with. I, I, the, the worst thing about my life is that I'm. I, I, I envied Don Johnson. Like, he was the man to me, okay? <laughs> me and I dressed like him in fucking junior high. I went to school, no socks on. That was my shit. I didn't uh, miss yeah. Mommy Vice on Friday too. night. And everybody's like, oh, look at you dressing like tubs. I'm like, god damn it, I hate being black. Because <laughs> 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 I'm trying to be Crockett right now. <laughs> You know what Everybody I mean? Everybody wanted to be Crockett. Nobody wanted oh, to be Tubbs. No one wanted to be Tubbs, nappy-ass hair and shit. I did not want to be Tubbs. <laughs> However, I still love that show. And that show actually got me... I think what motivated me to understand how much like music and visuals yes. go together. Yes. And That's the thing that I explain to people too. It's yes. like, think about the shows that were on back in the eighties. I mean, we're really dating ourselves, but none of the shows were using music the way Miami vice was. And no. it was like MTV cops. Nobody was using original music <laughs> or, you know, soundtrack music right. like that. And that just blew me away. And honestly, that was the first time I realized what the director was actually doing. Right. By, you know, and that's what that's what really did it. Because we would uh, in high school, we would emulate that shit, and we just Fuck go yeah. out. And we would go out and take. You know, we had a buddy who had like a Miata, like a white Miata convertible. <laughs> Mazda Miata. We, yeah, <laughs> Mazda <laughs> Miata. And we t- we go out to like these abandoned you know streets, <laughs> and we just set up these car chases. I mean, we were Fuck insane. Yeah. And we get on rooftops with guns and we stage those scenes and with the city in the background. It was just like we were so into Miami Vice. It was yep. ridiculous. And you had Glenn Fry in your head going, you belong yes, to the city. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know. No, that. we just steal the music and put it on. I know. I did the same thing. Because there's and nothing then, like then, the yeah. feeling with the music with, and the city. Uh, and the know, back. Yeah, there's nothing fun. like that feeling awesome. it brought. Yeah. yeah. Nobody. And, and, and when I, I didn't even know what like neo-noir was. And then later right. when I got to college, I'm like, we were doing neo noir, which didn't <laughs> right, know right. what Miami Vice was, and that's exactly what it, it didn't look like anything on TV either. And I think that's what was so inspiring. It's fucking it's like great, there's man. Something that made it stand out more than everything, like what was on like Magnum PI and stuff like that. Yeah. none of it looked like Miami Vice. None of it no. did. None of it did, and none and, of it and felt that's like why that. I just like fell in love with Michael Mann. I honestly yep, did. Yep. I thought this guy, everything he did after that was just like I got to see what he's doing. Oh yeah, and he's never. Really disappointed me. I love not this. once, not once. In fact, when you go and watch um, Collateral, yes, and you see and really feel that movie, there yes. is so much Miami Vice. I mean, even the mo- Miami Vice movie he made was great. Uh, yeah. I-, I loved it. A lot of people didn't like it, but I'm like, yeah. I still could understand what he was doing. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, I, but, I got it too. But I col- was- Collateral, yeah. man. The way collateral he... is amazing, Fuck. and, and even, even the way collateral looks with the the video because they were just doing those using those Viper cameras like yes before I think those had just come out and him and Fincher were like first ones using them right but um just the feel of it feels it's... like wicked low budget yes it does yes yeah, and it it's gorgeous very, yeah and so I, that's what I loved about it. I love that he was kind of pushing it when it, nobody else was really doing right. it now. These cameras obviously look so much better, but he was doing it when they didn't, and yeah. he was still making it look good. So. so here's something funny, man. So I'm sitting here, and I'm watching – they're going to hate me for bringing it up again, but I'm watching Cobra Kai because I fucking yeah. loved it. I Love fucking it. loved it. Right? <sighs> yeah. It's fucking great. <laughs> fucking yeah. great. I don't give a shit what you guys say. It's fucking right. great. Awesome. But yeah. what I learned as a filmmaker – is I'm watching Cobra Kai, is that I always see montages in my head when I'm writing yes, stories, yes, okay? Yes. And I always stop myself. Even with the Outrider, I had montages I wanted to do, but yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to shoot that. No one's going to get it, right? Because I always hear that fucking song playing. 
with you know telling a story with these visuals and these montages. So I'm watching Cobra Kai and I'm sitting there going, this show is loaded with them. And then I remembered Michael Mann again in Collateral and that scene where they're driving and Audio Slave comes on with Chris Cornell singing his ballad. Yeah. And the and the little fox or the wolf comes in the road. Yeah. Okay, that yes. is a beautiful fucking montage and you yes. feel it. There's so yes. much behind that. So that kind of shit as a filmmaker, when I see that, I'm like, okay, I have to trust my instincts. I have yes. to trust my gut. Because if I'm liking that shit, there is an audience out there that gets it. You know what? Brian Wynn would get it if I didn't. I would get it, yes. See what I'm saying? I so feel with anybody at your age. That that's, was... <laughs> well, no, that's, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> no, I would get it, too. I actually like those. Things. I do, too, man. No, that, that's a great point. I mean, and we did. We had a few montages in there as far as, like, you know, we, we played it off for narration to get the montages in right. there instead of being able to Because we were doing music. a noir. And, but, but me walking down the street in The Outrider, you know I had Don Johnson in my head oh, uh, walking through New York. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Which is why I tried yeah, to give yeah. you that overhead spin shot when you came by from the overhead <laughs> parking area. <laughs> mm -hmm. But God, that was hard to do. Almost fell 20 feet to my death. I know you did. Um, but no, but the other thing too is with the montage in the Outrider, guess what would have got cut? The montage? Because your story was so long. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm still learning. It's fine. I just don't trust the audience as much as I should, I guess, because I got to tell them too much. <laughs> well, I was, I, I, my original script for Thieves, well, my, the shooting script is 69 pages. I was basically thinking it was going to be a 70 minute movie. Yeah. That's what, uh, that's what, the following was the yeah. Chris Nolan movie, and I figured just get in and get out and go as quickly as possible because I figured I couldn't hold people's attention that long. I right. just didn't trust the audience because I feel like, especially now with YouTube and everything else, yeah. people's attention span is so short. I agree. Um, now you know what I mean. I, no, I agree. You know, the only I got one person I I, I go and it gets my back as a professional someone who's making it and it's joe rogan i listen to joe rogan's podcast oh, and I have yeah, a four fucking hour podcast and people listen to it so no, i'm like it's not a, over yet we okay, still people still have a chance that's joe rogan <laughs> i know that that's joe rogan. i know that but, when you're joe rogan you oh, can say that i'm trying <laughs> uh, just, just focus on being on the aaron carlson yeah, we'll get you built right, that's fine that's fine work on well you. outrider was what 120 page script i think it was it wasn't as bad as the three it was, hour yeah, it was 120 con. page script. Right? it was a three, three hour, hour and 27 minute it was film. not a three hour movie it was two hours and 16 minutes motherfucker <laughs> what was it before we started oh, editing what, though? it was two hours and 40 minutes yeah what are you but talking I, about which movie the outrider. Outrider. oh okay yeah, yeah. that one was but these guys you know these guys helped me cut it and i got it down to close to two hours but whatever i don't care <laughs> it um, was really long and then chuck and i went in there and kind of was like yeah you don't need that you don't need yeah that. You don't need well that. even it's funny because even the stuff i, I cut it down to the bare bones and everybody's like wait well, yeah, that shot's too long it's like you're never gonna please everybody no you know? you're not like, no you're you know? not like no. well, yours ran what 120 was it 120 yeah 120 and even okay. people were like and then some reviewers were like oh there could have been more character development it, it's it moves at a really good pace but it's almost too fast it's, it's like, like oh, oh yeah. how do you balance yeah. it man i mean you know you trust know. you don't trust the audience and you you know you make a shorter movie to keep their attention span they're like well i don't fucking get the characters I, well, and then you make you. a two-hour movie they don't fucking watch it and say it's boring well, <laughs> it's well too it's long too yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I, I look at something like Heat is like three hours, and you know, you oh, know that. I love every second so of it, well. though. But it's like, really, there's three big action scenes, and most of it is just talking heads. A lot of it is talking heads. It's yeah, Pacino that's and, true. And some of the best talking and, heads. Yeah, yeah. So the best, but it's those guys talking head scenes. So yeah. if you're De Niro and Pacino, you can get people to watch for three hours. Well, it depends. Wait a minute. Wait know. a minute. You no, mean people won't watch me for three hours? No. I would not watch Casino. I could not do oh, it. Oh, Casino. Boring. Oh, I love Casino. You can't so watch Casino? Sorry. You can't no, watch Casino? No, it's too freaking long. I can't Casino's do it. Casino is one of my favorites. Now, if you, mm. you want a three-hour movie that I can watch. Oh, God. Uh, Schindler's List. You like Thank that you. one a lot. I like yeah. Schindler's List. Yeah, so that's a great movie. There's some three-hour movies that do it, but some don't. That's okay. That's um, fair. Dances, At least you're fair. Was it Dances with Wolves? What was the other one? The really long there's been a lot of long movies. I watched one was Dances with Wolves on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dances okay. with yeah. That's so that, yeah, because hey. I remember watching it in the theater. Or Scarface one is my number Too one long. movie to this day. Scarface is, and that's almost three Scarface, hours. Yeah. Still my movie of choice to this it day. It depends because Scarface is okay, but okay. it just depends on who you are. Because no, well, that's you true. Can... No, I'll give you that. But if you got to give it to me. Scorsese movie or a Michael Mann movie that I'm in for whatever. No matter what, I'm with you. Yep, I'm with you. I can't get enough. That's fun, man. So um, I was going to ask you, you did a, when you did your showing, your first theater showing, you did that at the big theater in I, LA. We did it at the Staples Center, actually. They had a theater there. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And then we did a second one. It was funny because that was the first, it was a Hollywood film festival. Okay. 
uh, um, Hollywood Real Independent Film Festival, and this is right before COVID happened, and we did that, and then I had submitted to a couple of other um, festivals because there was a this guy this Peter Peter Green. He had actually had uh, um, he ran like four other festivals, so I submitted to one of his festivals that wasn't supposed to happen until. Um, until I think it was November actually. Okay. And, uh, but he saw the movie, I guess, for one of the other festivals. And then he was like, Hey, we've got a festival coming up like next week. He just called me out of the blue and said, Hey, I saw your movie. And do you want to come to this festival? And it was at the Chinese theater. Chinese theater. That's what I thought. Yeah. So So I was like, Oh, oh, of course. you know. (laughs) Okay. That that would be awesome. So, because that's you know, I mean, that's where I literally saw probably the first movie I ever saw, which was Star Wars, when I was like four years old. You did see it down there. Wow, man! Yeah. yeah. So you so, got to play your own movie at that theater. I know. So I got to play it there, and that was pretty much the highlight of my filmmaking uh, career so far. Okay. So but that's, that was awesome. That's the best shit ever, man. That is so, so that, good. That was a lot of fun. And then they offered to later. They called me and said, "Hey, we have a distribution company, and we want to distribute it too." So they. They, they're distributing the movie now. Okay, that's what my question was, because you went pretty much DIY in the beginning of this, right? I did. I just put it out on uh, Amazon, mm-hmm. and then um, just to see. I, I didn't really have hopes that it was going to be um, distributed. I, I just didn't. I just t- kind of took it as it came. And I figured, yeah. too, with COVID and everything, I just was like, well, everybody's at home anyway. Let's just put it out there mm-hmm. and see if it finds an audience. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it actually did. I mean, I, a lot of people did watch it over the summer. Um, yeah. And then, uh, um, and then it was just up there for a while. And then I had gotten somebody called me out of the blue. I didn't really go hunt for distributor or anything like that. Okay. I just got a call from some guy in like Arizona or something, and he had a pretty big company that distributed like ten movies a year. Okay. And he wanted to distribute it, but the thing I liked about this guy is he just totally got the movie. He's like, "Look, I get it. It's like you're doing Thief here at the end. It's a little yeah. bit of Manhunter." He's like, "I really get it." I'm a huge Michael Mann fan. Like he's like, I was in high school when Thief came out. And I think we saw it like three times in the theater. Badass so this movie. guy really understood the movie, right. and he really wanted to distribute it. But you got to read the fine print. When I got the contract, it was like ridiculous because oh. I feel like a lot of these distributors. distributors. And um, there's another podcast that uh, goes into this quite a bit. I'm sure you know Alex Ferrari. He yeah. Talked oh, yeah. About this before, yes. But um. It's really true because I looked at this thing and it was mostly just like all these fees I was going to have to pay for them right. to distribute my movie. So I'm like, well, what am I going to get out of this? Is this going to cost me a fortune to distribute my own movie? Why don't I just, why would I do this? Right. And at that point, it, I had already gone through Film Hub and um, it was on like seven different channels, including Amazon. And I figured I'm just going to let it ride and see what happens. Maybe I'll make money. Maybe I won't. But I'm not yeah. going to be spending money to get my movie to out there. To get your movie out and, there. Yeah. And then this guy from the festival circuit, when he said to me, hey, you know, we have a distribution company and we produce some movies and uh, would you want to do this? And I'm like, look, if this is some deal where I'm going to have to spend all this money for you guys to clear all the rights and all those other BS. <laughs> you can just no, the fuck off. Oh, yeah. And then I, I looked at and I'm a lawyer. I looked at the contract from the first one. It was so ridiculous. I could barely read. I would need a lawyer. An entertainment right. lawyer. <laughs> entertainment lawyer did look at it. Yeah. I couldn't do it. And then I looked at this guy's contract. I'm just like, oh, it's like three pages. And no joke. So it was like there was nothing for me to worry about. It was just like, look, if it goes, it goes. If it doesn't, I'm out nothing. But right. it's like this guy was, and again, this guy just got noir, and he just loved noir, and that was the thing. He yeah. just he just understood it. And then he called me up the other day and said, hey, we're doing the Marina Del Rey Film Festival, and we're going to put you in that. And um, you know, they're not doing it live, but we're going to put it on Roku, on a Roku channel there. So yeah. it'll be on internationally for at least uh, like three or four weeks. Sure. And I said, that'd be cool. So it's like, it's already paying off in a way because I okay. figured I'd probably get into some more festivals. And then also, you know, they'll do what they can. Like I said, it's it's a it's a, it's a a win-win situation for me. Cause right. If they come through and if it, if it gets on a lot of streaming services, which it sounds like it will, then great. You know, but yeah. I'm not on anything. And I just feel yeah. like that's the most honest thing you could do. Is just say, look, yeah, it may work, it may, it may not, but we're gonna try, and they are, and that's good. That's, so that's fucking great, good. man. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Go ahead, Chuck. So going into not going into all the numbers, but going into the numbers, let me ask you this: so going with a low budget, have you been able to recoup all your funds from making the movie? No, I have not. 
I have not. I can tell you that right now. I think, uh, I mean, from what I've generated on Film Hub, which is, you know, a decent amount, I don't think I'm there yet. Um, I haven't looked lately, but, um, you know, hopefully we'll get there. And, you know, if we're not, like I said, I'm on to the next one anyway. So. Right. And that's the beauty of the this this independent market, though, which is what, like, these guys have helped me with. Like, well, especially Sam here, because she's been pushing the film festival thing. I'm not a film festival guy. I'm more yeah. of that guy, hey, let's make our movie. Let's get it out there. Let's try to build an audience, and then we'll make another fucking movie and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing yeah. it. I don't want to pay a film festival to show my movie. But she's been pushing me to do this because she's like, hey, the networking, there's people there that you're going to yeah. meet and grow. Yeah. And I'm like, it only takes me I, five years to gotta, talk him into it. I know. I got to spend 85 bucks to fucking meet some people. No, <laughs> I mean, well, that's kind of where what? I'm at. But I, you, the, the, the key to the film festival thing is really uh, I, I got on Film Freeway. Um, you get in the early submissions. Maybe it's thirty-five bucks. Maybe right. it's yeah. forty. Maybe less. Okay, and then well, mine's going to be eighty-five because I'm late right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but to, but to you know, one. maybe you spend three. Okay, you budget it. I guess you could plan for this. Sure. Nobody really does, but you know, you get it out there. And you know, for me, I think we've been in um, you know four or five festivals. But I can tell you the ones that 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 they play at the Staples Center and obviously play at the the Chinese, I mean, I don't care what I spent on the other things. I got yeah. into those, and I was more than thrilled to have that to have happen to me. So that moment, yeah, to have that. Put a price on. Not, you know, that, put, not the experience. I'm with you. No, not the experience at all. It was, right. it was amazing. So. That's, that's cool, and that's kind of where I'm at now. So I feel excited again for our movie because I figured, okay, we put Outrider up there. It had its run. It got a lot of views. It got a lot of minutes streamed. We didn't make much money because Amazon's cheap as fuck, but okay. Yeah. But, you know, hopefully we built our name a little bit and built kind of yeah. an audience. So for the next movie, we, go, we, we you know piggyback off that. But now I'm kind of excited again. I'm like, well, you know, it is an indie film. It's not majorly being, you know, pushed all over the planet. Yeah. We can go to film festivals and do what Sam says because she's fucking smarter than me. Well, yeah. no, my yeah. logic just told me that. Indie, there's an indie following at a film festivals. I mean, that's what people. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if people frequent film festivals, they love indie movies. So that's <laughs> kind of where you know, if you're doing indie movies, hmm, Jesus, seems, I wish I would have thought of that. Like, <laughs> logical, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I didn't. I honestly didn't. I just like it was another dollar bill to me. It was like another bill. I'm like, why are yeah. we gonna? Yeah. I didn't get I, the value, but I see the value now. So I, I like I said, I was never a big fan of the indie film festivals before, mm-hmm. and I don't think I. Would have even made a run if I hadn't made a feature. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not worth it for short films and stuff right, like that. Right, right, right. There's really not a big market, obviously. You know this for short films. So it's like, but with a feature, um, you know, if it gets if it gets seen, things can happen. And I've, I've seen happen. that. And it's not like, I mean, to the extent that I know you market your movie on Facebook and you've done some stuff. And I've kind of done what you did. It's like put it out to all these different forums and things mm-hmm. like that. Let people know that it's out there. But, I mean, it's not like I'm spending tons of money on the marketing it's right. just and i'm willing to just let it go and say it is what it is if people watch it i got some reviews i had some you know some professional reviewers uh give it good reviews and things like that so yeah, man. for me at the end of the day i was i was happy with where it ended on amazon and and then the next opportunity came up and that was just kind of bonus so, you know yeah. i just feel like at the end of the day and i think you know this you probably feel this way too it's the work that matters and if you're satisfied with the movie and that you know maybe not everybody got it but the people that it was for really got it right. and they really enjoyed it and you feel like you did a lot better than the last thing you did um i think that's in and of itself is like the most satisfying thing ever that's all it's mean? about absolutely so, yep man yeah. look at brian win <laughs> breaking it down <laughs> encouraging you to just keep thinking the way you're thinking well, I'm trying to get Thanks, better Brian. at it. I'm, I'm, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I had this in my head. He just kind of made uh-huh. me remember I had it already oh, in my head. Oh, okay. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Chuck and I thank you extra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, like you, though, Brian, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm trying to, to do with my stories. It's like there's so much I can't do on my own. And when I started Outrider, when I talked to Chuck and Sam the first time, I'm like, I can't do this by myself. I can't. Yeah. If we're going to try to escalate what we're doing and make a production company and try to be a, a indie filmmakers and maybe one day have a career doing this where we can yeah. quit our day jobs, I can't do this fucking shit alone. I can't yeah. do it anymore. Yeah. If we're going to escalate it and make it really good and make it something special, I need help. 
and they jumped on board, man. So I'm grateful, and I know I'm usually a fucking asshole on this show. <laughs> However, I mean that you know on, that. just on the show you're I'm an a asshole? sweet asshole. Uh, <laughs> I really well, am. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing: is um, that's very true, and I think that uh, I mean, there's guys that I worked on. There's a guy named Eric Rangruber who I, who did my all the effects for my movies for my last two short films, and I've known this guy. Um, since I was probably 20 years old, okay. many, many years, because I helped him with stuff. And he's been right there helping me now. So it's like, I feel like there's people you're going to pick up along the way, whether it be actors or crew people or friends or whatever, right. that are going to follow you on this journey. You know yeah. what I mean? And they're yeah. going to be there to have your back. And I feel like when you build that little community, wherever you are, wherever you're making mm-hmm. these movies, that's so valuable. And I it feel is. like I've made some of my best friends on these movies, you know, and That's it's, what it's about it's awesome. creating you know, a absolutely. team. Chuck. Yeah. It's it's a team. A team. Yeah. The last step, the last podcast I tried to say, Hey Chuck, and what do you call that? And what do you call it? Chuck? Which part collaborating, joined together. Uh, it's a family. It's a family. It's, it's a, a family. family. It's it a is. Family. No, it, yeah. is. it is. It is. Yeah. It is. And that's, that's, that's why, the, you know, and that's why is. you don't have to like them all that's the time, important. but they're family. Yeah. Yeah. Like today, Chuck. We, um, but yeah. we're still family. I didn't greet you very nicely. <laughs> That's okay. But yeah. I still love you. I know. Too funny. And you're here. I am. The question is, can you leave? And I'm sitting all this kinds of close to you. <laughs> yeah, Chuck's a little creepy sometimes. No. Oh, That's no. okay. Though, oh, Chuck. no. You know, I still love you. So, Brian, but, you said... You know, I think I think we're all just trying to... to I mean, it's crazy that, um, that I still get to do this in some form... Thing that this thing I've been doing since I was probably 14 years old. So since Miami Vice was on, you know, oh, yeah. and uh, yeah. that's I'm sure you feel the same way that I you do. get to be able to do this, even if it's not your full time job. It doesn't yeah. matter because guess what? Like even the people we know who are making these movies and making a living at some point are doing it as a second job now because it's really hard to be making independent films. Yeah. You know, Can I ask you? A per- this is going to be personal. You ready for sure, this sure. one? Go ahead. Do you like going to work as a lawyer? I do. I do. Okay. What if you hated your job like I do? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what, could you see how I can go to work and I, I half ass it at work and I still do better than a 75% of the other people I work with and I'm just winging it. Like uh, my brain is not even there and I'm sitting here going, I'm wasting so much time. But that's my, I know that's my own personal guilt as a person because I wasted so much time in my life not doing something. When I knew I love stories, I was writing, I wrote two books in the 90s, you know what I mean? And I yeah. tried to get them published. Long story, I'll tell you about that one day. Um, however, you know, I always had these stories in my head forever. And I didn't start, I, I stumbled across filmmaking on a laptop one day when I saw that it had Windows Movie Maker on it. And I'm like, yeah. what the fuck is this? I think it was like 2000, 2001. And yeah. I'm like, holy yeah. shit, maybe this is the platform I'm supposed to tell these stories. Maybe it's not right now. Was that Silent Shadows when you couldn't figure out the audio? I couldn't even fucking. I made a silent movie, dude, because I couldn't figure out how to get the audio from the fucking camera, the DV camera, to the goddamn uh, whatever editing software we were using at that time. Yeah. You know, but I mean, that's where we started. Everything we learned has been on our own. No film school, no nothing. Just no, doing our yeah. shit. But we all nothing. love fucking movies. We love movies. Well, not all of us. I'm not as You love about. movies. You do. You get into them and you get into TV the a lot. You, get, you just won't watch also, anything. Yeah, but also yeah. you're creative. I mean... Well, well, I can, I, I'll tell you this too. Uh, the reason I like... Well, I like what I do anyway. Um, but I... Uh, the, my, the partners at my firm actually are huge supporters of this movie and they actually became producers on the movie. So oh, they, oh, wow. they gave me, you know, some financing. They gave me full access to the, to the, um, to their homes to shoot. Right. This, this, this big house in the movie belongs to my, one of my bosses. Um, they gave me, you know, um, was that the one with the swimming pool? Is that that one? That's the one with the swimming pool. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the one. That's badass. So she, she gave us that. We had that for like a, a weekend to shoot there. We that's had, cool. Yeah, I had nice. access. To, I turned my, my office here until to basically like a, a little mini studio where I could shoot anytime I needed to on the weekends. We actually shot the inside the heist sequence there where okay. they actually couldn't get the money. So I, I will tell you that um, it was just lucky and i that i had this opportunity to be working here and then they just bought into my dream you know what i mean no and i get that's it been for the last two films i made or two shorts i made it was the same kind of situation right, right. so i feel like that's what kind of reinvigorated me is like oh they just wanted to be a part of it and they wanted to 
so so it, everything kind of collided. I right. don't think I would be doing what I'm doing now. I wouldn't have made Thieves, actually, because right. I had their blessing to be like, oh, well, you know, take a break and go shoot this movie and right. work it out. For this you know, and I, so. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't See, say that because one, one of the locations we shot was at your my work. Job. Yeah. yeah, so we're right. pulling off Donovan Industries. That's at my job. You just yeah. haven't learned you know, to embrace yeah. it as much as Brian No, because I'm fucking to. pissed. I waste so much time in my life, and i got to hurry up and get this shit done. You need to get over it. You, I need gotta... to, you can make them work together. <laughs> they can... Be be cohesive, you, like cohesive. You, you you mold the two together. Excuse me. You meld the two together pretty well. Yeah, they they actually pay me at For my job while. to do a lot of our movie shit because I'm at my desk doing movie shit instead of the actual work I'm supposed to be right. doing. Right. So is I anybody know. that lucky? Not a lot. No. No. I still so got to put up with you, it. You have to learn how to make it. We're getting there. That's what this podcast is about, inspiring everybody to keep going, keep, yeah. keep trying. Well, yeah. well, I think you just have to find a balance to do the things yeah. that you – and I, I will tell you this, that I feel like when I was working in Hollywood and trying to do it as my job, I ended up hating it. I ended up hating the business. I ended right. up hating the, the people. And I was at a place where I could see where You're all the really fun. successful people were and what they did, and a lot of those people were assholes, yeah. you know I mean? just giant assholes. So I would say that – that gave me an insight into, okay, well, these people are at the top. Some of them are winning Oscars and things like that and making tons of money. But they were miserable people. And I'm like, mm. do I want to spend all this time in the business and be miserable like them? Because it's like it takes so much to get to the top, and then you're just worried that somebody's going to take it away from you. So you're just even more scared and paranoid and mean. And I hated that. I yeah. hated all that. And I was like, this is not worth it. So I guess it's like – you know, yeah, you can be a, a small fish and, and basically doing your own thing, but you might be happier than the person that's the big fish that's Absolutely. really at the top and just holding on and clinging on to their power and success, which it's incredibly hard because it's it's, it's everything. It's your whole life where, yeah. where, yeah, I don't have to necessarily make movies, but when I do, I'm doing it because I really want to and it's fun. Right. It's like Tarantino once said. He was only well. He's saying this now. He's only going to make ten movies because he never wanted to be making movies just to make movies to make a living. Right. He wanted to make movies that were good. He didn't want to be one of those old directors that started making shitty movies and be a director for hire. Right. He wanted all of his movies to basically say, "I'm past it. There's my collection of movies, and I'm they'll good. Just be admired in history and uh, or criticized or what have you." But I'm not going to keep going until I'm 65 or 70 and making bad movies. I mean, I right. guess there's a great point. Like, so, that's a great yeah, point. Yeah. And Tarantino so. to me is a storyteller. I mean, that's right. what yeah, he he's is. Storyteller. You know, he's yeah. not I mean, a, necessarily just a director or a writer. No, he's he, a storyteller. He yes, tells he his has, shit. His yeah. yeah. Stories, and yeah. I, I like that. I always have. Yeah. That's what it's about though. I think that people sometimes can lose sight of that when they're trying to, when they have, when they set different goals than just mm-hmm. trying to express themselves and tell their stories. Yeah. When well, they, yeah, they, you, it can you, get you can get caught up in the money thing or the fame or thing. Trying to figure out what's coming, what the audience is going to like. Why don't you just make what I think? Then that's what Tarantino did. He didn't care what no. the audience wanted. Yeah, he, he made his shit, and he was like, like he it, liked. Leave it. Just want to make stuff that he liked. That yeah. He yeah. With his friends, and that's know? why it was so shocking and so great when you watch Pulp Fiction or you see the ear come off in Reservoir Dogs or you, yeah. you meet the gimp right. for the first time yeah. and you're like, what the fuck is the gimp? Yeah. He literally you know, gave what no Hollywood is <laughs> What Hollywood producer yeah. is ever going to be okay with that if you didn't do it on his own? Well, and, yeah. and because of it's successful and made money, it was like, give us more. You know, right. you made an $8 million movie and it made like $300 million yeah. and won an Oscar. So yeah. it's like, you know, that's the thing. And that's what I think is... Again, going back to kind of Nolan and, and Tarantino, it's like if you can make those, you know, I mean, Reservoir Dogs was like 1.5, I think, million. Yeah, was yeah. Too much time. But people could see that he was going to gonna be something. I mean, I think they knew. I mean, people were calling him the next Kubrick and stuff like that. I, I heard a story once that they were saying for all the music that was in that movie, it was like it would have cost a fortune. They couldn't afford all that music. Um, right. They couldn't afford the rights to all that. And right. basically they were cutting deals. The music supervisor was saying, look, this guy is really special. He's going to be in the next Kubrick. You should give us this for a, a discount. And, and they did. <laughs> they believed in him that much. So Fuck. I think it's uh, it's cool, man. You know, whatever. But not everybody's Tarantino. Not everybody's Kevin Smith. And we got to do our own thing. Right. Find right. Way. right. And even if we don't end up like them, so what? I still want to be able to make movies until I... I'm tired of me. Yeah, yeah, until you're done. That's the until best thing done. to do is to believe in yourself and your movies and tell your stories yeah. and not get lost in all that. 
and not get lost and if people don't like it who right because yeah, it I don't loses shit either, you, man. yeah when you start to care about that you lose it loses its magic no and that's the thing with this this form of art that we're doing and i'm sure everybody else was like that you've, you've got a specific audience you're looking for that's it yeah you know yeah. and if it's not for everybody some people aren't going to yeah. get it and those are the people that will probably say how shitty it is and that's okay because i didn't make it fucking for you anyway i mean that's <laughs> the truth <laughs> that's the way it is and they don't seem so to how, get how that. do you uh, how do you let me ask you this how do you deal with the haters when you see a bad review and people clearly just wanted to like just bash it he for whatever so reason good. i don't yeah it does not affect me at I, all. I never say anything i was just wondering how does it make you feel about that in I mean, inside yeah inside and in, nothing I, I honestly don't yeah. feel anything in yeah. fact i i read it very carefully to see if there's anything in there i did wrong and there was one review i got that had a one star rating that actually made sense to me because i felt like the the the, the viewer was confused because the yeah. artwork on the on the film was in color, and yeah, then it, it, you know he turns it on and it's in black and white, and it pissed him yeah. off. Okay, maybe that's my fault. Maybe I can think about something like yeah. that. Maybe film yeah. noir isn't enough to understand it if it's in color. You know, that's yeah. why it's on the poster that way. But you know, that was the only one I really could say constructively that I said, okay, I can understand that guy's review. He was disappointed. It was in black and white. Well, the thing about Aaron is he doesn't get hurt. To no. the, he doesn't let that get to him. So he's able to look at all these reviews as like constructive criticism, even if they're mean to me. Yeah. I will cry if they're just mean <laughs> for being mean. Yeah. But to me, that's just awful. Like, why are you just trying to be mean and hurt somebody? It's different for me. Like, I can't take it like he can, but he takes it so well that he's able to see the hidden, you know, things that people say that are important and take actual well, hints from that. And I try to. Change, I know. try to. I don't know if I'm right, but I try to look at it that way. I mean, it's but, a good way to look at it. And that's that's what another sad thing is. So, you know, I don't. I was looking for Brian online because he was online for a while, right? And he disappeared. And I sent him a personal <laughs> message like, bro, you all right? What's going on? Because the fire's in L.A. Yeah. I was like, is, is my man, did he get burned uh, up? You reaching out. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like literally concerned, not just because you were coming on the show, but like because he was posting, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and, and selling yeah. his movie yeah. and, and trying to get people to watch it. And then he was gone. And I'm like, where the yeah. fuck is this guy? Is where my man I, I deactivated for a little bit. Yeah. He, he yeah. had to take a break brutal. because of people's fucking mouths. Yeah. And here so, I still am on Facebook, like battling with him. But well, I, don't, I don't take it deeply. I mean, these people get so angry and so upset about stuff. And I'm like, they have no idea. I'm just fucking with them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. they really don't. Yeah. And I don't take it personally because I don't, I, no one's going to listen to me anyway. Who the fuck am I? Well, so you That's say, how I feel. but you're, you just like debating. That's why you like I like it. debating because I like I, – I, it actually builds, like, shit in my brain for stories and characters I, and people. I, I used to engage with people, and I think after – I think it was after 2016, I decided it wasn't worth my time to argue with strangers anymore. And so, right. And yeah. I just decided – it wasn't constructive, and I really wasn't posting that much. And I decided Facebook was going to be more of a marketing tool for my movie That's, and really tried to stay out yeah. of anything that could be uh, controversial. Well, and then well, I what's, well I look, look, yeah. Brian, Brian is both you and me. <laughs> well, no, what's, what's really funny, though, and Brian, me. that I got to tell you is when I, when I started my political jaunt on Facebook, I actually made a post in July. About, hey, I'm getting ready to start a podcast, and I'm just kind of feeling everybody out. So you're going to see some obscure posts from me politically, blah, 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 blah. So just remember that. Let's go. Yeah. And I started just drilling, <laughs> making the most obscene fucking shit I could think of to say, just to see what would happen. And next thing I know, people started sending me messages going like, I don't know what's going on, but you shouldn't be this political and this and that and this. And I'm like, yeah, did you guys forget? Well, there was people that were jumping on the comment section Mm. in those posts so deeply and so passionately (laughs) that I couldn't help but laugh at them. Like, you guys have no idea that this was a human experiment to me. I already posted it. You guys forgot about that. Now you're, you're just, it happened just the way I thought it would. It's so entertaining I, to you. So, but what's funny is I reminded these people that were commenting on my post so passionately about their side. I, I reposted the original post I made about, hey, this is an experiment. You know yeah. what? They don't bug me anymore. Because they know I'm not that serious about it. It's yeah. like because you're an asshole, yeah. and you were like, "Huh? Well, jokes on you." <laughs> no, because I did learn something. Though it did help me learn something about what's going on in our in our country about certain people that is really hard to understand. But I know we're not talking about politics, Sam. No, we're Sam, not. Sam no, doesn't like no, politics. No. Oh no. I, well, oh, we I don't will do that say either. that I will just leave it at uh, you know whatever people's sides they are encamped on. I would say 
social media has been one of the most divisive things our country has ever seen. Absolutely. Like it's Absolutely. the worst. It's Absolutely. the worst. Because they don't have and the balls so, to say that in person. That's why. You know, so yeah. I, I just feel like it, it hasn't done good for, for either. For, for anybody. For it's anybody, really, really sad. It's like built hate and like, yeah, but, like you said, diversity. But look how, much, and, look how good it is for artists, though. Mm, and, for artists. Yeah. For creatives. Yeah. For someone who can take the, the negative like you can. Sure, but you know but if like we for me, but well think about it. If you go back, no if you go back to 1992, and we made the Outrider, no one would have seen it, no one would that's have heard true. of it, no that's one would have known about it if it wasn't for the internet. That's the thing about it. That's, that's why the it's trick. Great for marketing, and it, yes. it's great. It's a positive thing. I mean, Instagram yes. and and uh, and Facebook have been, and even Twitter to a certain extent have been. I mean, I don't know. Where do you guys feel like you've gotten the most kind of? If power? it wasn't for those platforms, and Twitter gave us the best. Do you think it was Twitter? I think. I think so, it was actually Kelvin Facebook. came from Twitter. Well, Kelvin came from Twitter, yeah. But as far as our audience goes, I always feel like Facebook did. I think I hit. Uh, oh, I, I, I hit shoving it down their fucking throats. Yeah, I'm an anti-Facebook. <laughs> Every day. Um, I, I, I oh, felt no, like no. after a while it was overkill and I just wanted to let it go. Yeah, I, I did I did know. now. I did now. Yeah. Um, but for, for a while there, that it seemed to help because yeah, there was no I other did. way we were marketing, you know? Yeah, and yeah. we watched no, our, and I, the minutes I boost. Like it, was, it was weird. It, it, it definitely got, uh, you know, a lot of traction from Facebook. And I think good, all the people good. that... If you're going to all those different groups too, and I think you've done a little bit of that too, sure. um, some of the, like the neo noir groups and things like that, I mm -hmm. think. And some people like, oh, this shouldn't be in the group because it doesn't fit the close. Like, oh, shut up. Or oh, fine, I'll take it down. But you know, if you right. watch, watch it. And um, I think some of the most ardent supporters of it came from some of those groups at the beginning. I think that when mm -hmm. it first came out, I had people writing, people I didn't know, people that just were really into noir and wrote really beautiful, sure, you know. Comments like, and reviews. I'm with and now you. I just feel like it's people in the middle of the night who want to just yeah. say, hate on your movie. It's not a lot movie. of genuine. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. just it's just shit talk now. Yeah, so. exactly. And that's whatever. Yeah. That's a part of the game, man. It it's is. part of it. And it, but then I look at it, it's like any movie that we think is great. We probably go on IMDb right now and look up Heat, and people would be like, "This movie sucks." That's how I look exactly. at it. Like, yeah, because yeah, exactly. We talked about that, Chuck. Like I look up Thor uh, Ragnarok, and people were yeah. fucking hating. I'm, I'm like, Thor Ragnarok's a shit. What the fuck is wrong yeah. with people? Well, yeah, well, there's always going to be people it, that hate something. Yeah, yeah, they're they're so miserable that they have to do that. That's that's yeah. all they got. Yeah, and people hate it's on sad. Cobra Kai. What the fuck? People well, hate Cobra, Cobra Kai, seriously. It's like the one thing I've watched. I, I've watched it way too much because my daughter, who's 10, it's one of the things she loves oh, to watch. We have an 11-year-old. Yeah. And she's she right knows. with me on it, bro. And my two yeah, sons and she's were. she's just like so into it and has some people that were in some shows that she liked too. Yeah, so yep, I, same here. Just, yeah. And now she's like, cause yesterday I'm like, wait, I think the girl who plays, the Peyton List who plays the girl who beats up Sam. You guys yeah. know what I'm talking about. I do, I do, I do. So I don't. I only saw one episode. Spoiler. Shut up. <laughs> he doesn't, he doesn't but care. we figured out that her last name is the same as Allie's married name, so they're probably related. They're so. probably related. See yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, and I was like, my, my daughter's like mind was just blown by that. Like, <laughs> oh my God, Allie's going to be related to, to her? And it's like, oh, well, we'll see. But being a man of the 80s like myself, how cool is fucking Johnny? Awesome. No, I mean, you know what? Awesome. Know, if you spit that awesome. on me, I, just I am did it, literally going to. Because he's right with me. I'm going to hit you. My man's no, no, no joke. You know what? But the, the thing that you hit on earlier about that show is they totally embraced the 80s-ness of yes, it all. Yes, they did. The music. If, if you liked a certain kind of music, you liked everything. Yeah. Anything there. I mean, they're they're all the new wave or if you were in a rock or whatever you were into. And like you said, the montages, it's like they're pulling everything from there. And, you know, it never leaves the top 10 on Netflix because I know like still there. I have kids now yep. that are watching these shows and we're rewatching the shows. Yeah. So I'm yeah. telling you like the eighties is not going away. It's we're not going away. It. We're not. So it's okay to do <laughs> stuff. Like my next project is going to be very influenced by like the lost boys. And it's going to have oh. eighties stuff. And yeah, so so he's been on a kick okay. of showing all the '80s shows to the kids. That's all, all been watching, like, and they're yeah. all on board, bro. Our 11 year old daughter more than I think everybody. Like she's on it. Like yeah. something about that age group that they love it. Yeah. yeah, they do. They do. Actually, I just showed. uh We just watched Adventures Babysitting and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and, and she was in awe. And, every and I'm time, like, yeah, yeah. Every because time Ed Rooney like, is no favorite. joke, even though he's a child molester guy. But he was no joke. It's Ed Rooney. Did you know that, by the way, Chuck? 
Why are you pointing at me? Like, I know these fuckers personally. <laughs> I was so disappointed when I found that out. I went to work oh, the next day. I'm like, we watched Ferris Bueller and Ed Rooney's a shit because I loved Ed Rooney. Right. And then I find out in 2003 or something, he did some bad shit. And I'm like, oh, what? Yeah, yeah, I'm what? like, yeah. what? It's work. Jeffrey, what's his name? Jeffrey. I, I can't remember his name now. I have to forget about it because he did we, some we bad. Did but... <laughs> in the movie, though. We did a we did Adventures in Babysitting and Ferris Bueller's Day Off too. I I don't know if my daughter liked as much as I did, but I think it'll grow oh, on her. But she was very much into Back to the Future. Me too. We just did that too, yeah, dude. We did, that one too. we did all three. Yeah. Um, isn't that fun, man? Yeah, it, it's awesome. It's I mean, the when best. they and I've been. Showing her this stuff since she was old enough to like get it. Good mm-hmm. for you. Back to the Future was like even when they would, even like uh, oh like and it was funny because I showed her the Superman movies because that was a huge inspiration for me. The yeah, especially one, Superman too. And um, I the one she kind of like got into, which is not the best one, was Superman three because the Richard Pryor is like, fucking hilarious. Yeah, the Richard Pryor one, which I, I <laughs> it's fun. It's not the best one, but it's it's funny. It's funny, but um. But even like they did a uh, a revival screening of it at the New Beverly here, but it's just Tarantino's theater. So to to see it on the big screen because I'd never even seen it on the big screen. Oh, with I don't her, think I did either. It was awesome. That That's was fucking awesome. cool, man. Yeah. So. I have a question <sighs> that's totally off subject, but is your daughter a TikToker too? She... she is not actually. Oh, okay, you're not. Yeah, not thing. <laughs> Our daughter's a super TikToker. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, yeah. She's not it's got to be an age thing because my okay. So I have four children. I have a blended family, so not all my kids were with me all at the same times. However, my daughter, who has been with me for her entire life, she's a horror person, right? Because she well, grew up with me. Yeah, yeah, because you love horror movies, right? Right. So that makes sense. I understand the influence that you can have on your children by encouraging right. what yeah, the but things what is. But you don't have to, to do? influence anybody to love yeah. the 80s. You don't have to. People get that shit. Right. They just get it. You watch it, you hear it, and you're like, oh, fuck, that's well, cool. I, I mean, that's all, that's all feeling, I have. That's all There's a certain feeling about the 80s that you can't get any other way. No, no. man. No, it's, it's totally unique. It's to the music, right. the movies, I mean, everything about it. The TV shows, everything about the 80s was great. It was fuck like yeah. when the world was wonderful. Dude, Tuesdays was fucking Moonlighting, and Friday night was fucking Miami Vice. Well, you, oh, and you could be, moonlighting. You could be moonlighting. cool. You could be cool. Oh, yeah, yeah because I my, my personality is David Addison and fucking Don Johnson. That's me. Oh, whatever. Crockett. Anyway. It's a little harder to be cool. I just happen to be black. I mean, <laughs> he just happens to be black. And you happen to be an asshole. Oh, Moon, moonlighting was one of my absolute. Oh favorite my god, me too, I love. Buddy. Yes, I loved it. Love yes, so yes. You realize that I was I was in my room listening to that episode that they actually had, where they had the episode of the kid listening and watching the trying to watch the show. I was actually in my room, supposing to do my homework. Oh yeah, yeah. On yeah. that exact episode where they were playing off that same thing, where that they just wanted thing. to. Go through the same. Did your parents like, like Moonlighting? Did oh, they watch it? Of yeah, because yeah, it's Maddie Hayes, David Dad, Edison. Dad watches everything. They're fucking badass. Yeah, that was, oh. a, that was a time. That's a yeah, good time. Miami Vice, all that stuff. Good for mm-hmm. sharing it, though. I mean, I think these kids get some, and that's what's cool about Cobra Kai. They blend these these two different eras together brilliantly. But I it mean, totally works. Yeah, I it totally it works. Yeah, yeah, I would never watch these. I, I try to, but they don't hit me right. That Like what your daughter's watching at home. She's like, oh, yeah, I know her from this show. I haven't watched those shows very much either. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but when you mix them together, I'm like, oh, they're, they're fucking oh, cool. That's the thing. And that's why, I mean, of course, they're pulling kids from those audiences and then all of us are watching it. So it's, but like I said, Cobra Kai has been in the top 10 ever since it came out. I don't think yeah. it's going to leave the top 10. People just keep rewatching it over it's and over fucking, and over. Yeah. So, well, I mean, you I can't guess deny YouTube, it's good. It's fine. It's, but then again, it like, couldn't save RedTube. So, I mean, how good is it really? Or YouTube? Yeah, yeah I guess Or RedTube or yeah. whatever yeah, it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no one yeah. was really into that anyway. Well, because YouTube's think, been free like, too long. They're not going to pay for this shit. I think they were, um, <laughs> I think when I, when I actually looked into that, it looked like YouTube decided they just wanted to focus more on their YouTube people, their stars and, deal with that they don't want they want to get out of the live action business they basically just sold it to netflix yeah well apparently netflix wanted it first and then youtube offered more right yeah the funny thing is i paid for youtube red and i never once watched any of their i know and you had it and i had no idea it's hard to get rid of for the music it was for the music that because you don't want to listen to the commercials so you get rid of it for that but then you don't think about tv on youtube why would you think of that I don't know. I didn't. <laughs> they do original content. Well, they did. Or like shows and movies now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think a lot of us were watching on that YouTube Red only because you could get it there. And then all yeah. of a sudden now it comes on Netflix and it's like, oh, this thing is so cool. It's like, yeah, we saw it like a year and a half ago or two right. on YouTube already. So <laughs> That's fucking great. Well, you said you were working on something, man. We're going to get ready to close the show out here soon because we, we've been on for a little bit. But uh, what, what are, right. what's, your new, what's your newer project you're working on? You said you had something else going. 
Yeah, so um, I, it's kind of an idea I'm developing. Um, I had a buddy who really liked thieves, and he uh, he has this big place up in Santa Cruz, and he was like, hey, and I pitched him this idea that's kind of related to kind of an homage to the Lost Boys. Um, i get more into details when I get it kind of ironed out. Sure. But, Lost um, Boys is my favorite. I love it. So we just much. watched that a couple months ago. So yep. my favorite. That was on so, my list of ones to put on. So yeah, I mean, I I just felt like, and he just dug the idea so much, and he had grown up up there with a lot of people when they were shooting the Lost Boys, and knows a lot of people who are in the Lost Boys, and, mm-hmm. and we just thought it'd be kind of interesting to kind of maybe bring some of the actors back from the Lost Boys, and maybe show them as older, and not a direct sequel, but some kind of like it's referencing obviously sure. the Lost I love Boys. It. So. That's so, cool, um, so, and he, so awesome. and he felt like he could get financing. Um, he has a lot of connections up there. So I'm like, yeah, let's just, let's just do this thing next. So I've been really studying up on a lot of Santa Cruz kind of noir stories and sure. things like that. And, um, but yeah, it's going to be vampires. Are you going to do it in black and white? You're going to do no, no, oh, okay. big, big color. I want to make it look like a studio movie. Okay. Yeah. And dude, bring back the guy with the fucking saxophone. Playing. Oh yeah, the <laughs> you get that guy, dude. You're, you're gold. You're well, my, fucking my, gold. So my goal is to make it better than the two like crappy direct-to-video sequels. Oh, I, I never watched those. I couldn't. I watch didn't either. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't watch, watch them either. They're terrible. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, Jason but, um, Patrick is what I need. I need Patrick. I need Patrick. He's a bad. Yeah, you need you need Jason Patrick. You need all those people back. Yeah, you keep and all those guys. Fuck so. yeah. What a challenging like it's a t- it's that's that's a cool one. I that's like fucking that you're fun, doing dude. That. I, well, I congratulations, yeah. buddy. Keep, so, keep and I, I, away. I guess I just and I had just rewatched the Lost Boys and then Schumacher passed away and I thought, hey, I know. wouldn't this be cool to like do a, a kind of an homage and bring back that kind of and again eighties and referencing yeah. and and the music and the guy I'm talking to also has a lot of connections to a lot of bands up there and well a lot of bands in general. So he's and he's a big eighties music guy. So. So yeah, so we're gonna. It's gonna be packed full of '80s soundtrack and all that's gonna be. It's gonna be bitching. So. Very cool. Very excited. Well, you we'll me be over. waiting. I'll be, we'll be waiting. It. I'll be watching. <laughs> well, if you need a second director, maybe we'll send Aaron down to give you a hand for a weekend. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah. we'll be fine. We'll be like, do you remember that one episode of that one show? And he'll be like, yeah, I got it. And then we'll be like, all right, that's what we're gonna do. And he'll be like, that's what we're gonna do. And then we would do that shit. And it would be fucking. You guys badass. are definitely on the It'll same page. It'll be fucking bad. And then we'll hash brown it stuff, and we'll yeah. send it to the internet. Is what we're <laughs> no, we're not hash browning <laughs> anything right now. <laughs> oh no! You know what time it is before we end the show? No, 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 no! Oh, it's time. You I'm get sorry. the music. Brian, I'm sorry. Welcome to the last big three. Yes, this is the last big three, and I'm your host, Brett Armstrong. And today we have Brian's on our program. Brian, welcome to our show. Brian, have you ever heard of the last big three? No. Oh, that's what? what is it? The last big three. And I'm Brett Armstrong. So we've got three questions for you, Brian. Sure. These three questions are going to relate with if you had only one day left on the planet Earth, what would you do? What would I do? And I have three questions for you. This is your last day, okay? Got it. Question one. (laughs) (laughs) What actor would you have lunch with? Actor to have lunch with famous um, actor Brian. Hmm. I don't know. Now I think it would be Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. That's a great <laughs> answer. Yeah. Let's give it up for. I'm Brian. so shocked. That's a great answer. <laughs> that is That's the answer. first time I've been yeah. that shocked. Okay. <laughs> Benjamin Button in this one. All right. Question two. On your last day on Earth, Brian, what Marvel movie would you watch? Ooh. Would I watch? Um. What Marvel movie would you watch? I'm not a huge Marvel fan, but I would say uh, Thor Ragnarok. Oh, what a wonderful <laughs> choice. How ironic that we heard that earlier in the program. <laughs> no, just because Thor, yeah, the first Stop. Avengers movie, or not Avengers, but the first uh, Captain America movie. That's a great movie. I love that one. That yeah. one's awesome. Oh, right. Is, is disturbing You're the dog. Messing, well, sorry, dog. Should we go to commercial break? <laughs> no. Stop go ahead. Clapping. And question three. <laughs> Ryan, your last question for the last day on earth. What karaoke song would you sing? Um, karaoke song would I sing on my last day on earth? Uh, I would sing True Faith by New Order. True. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great I love answer. That. That, is a, that is a good answer. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Brian, <laughs> so much for playing The Last Big Three. What's I'm Brett Armstrong, and I'm going to say goodnight and Godspeed. Right, that was awesome. Thank you, guys. Good night. All right, my brother. Awesome. Thanks for being thank on the show, so man. Thanks so much. For Thanks, Brian. Appreciate you, buddy.
This is so much fun, you guys. Yes, well, it was so it's going to be available? Uh, sometime this week. We're probably going to air it on Saturday, I'm thinking. This okay. Saturday, since we're doing a little early. So by the time people hear it, it should be Saturday. All right. For yeah. sure. All Probably right. Saturday. That's where we're going to have it on my band. We'll shoot you a message right, before thanks, we guys. post Take a second share. You're yeah. welcome. Hey, Thank good you luck so to everything you're doing, buddy. Time. Thank you guys for having me on. It was a- awesome. Absolutely, man. All right. I'll talk to you soon, my friend. All right. All, All right, you. bud. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the show. Hey, if you'd like to be a guest on Around the Real, please reach out to us at our website. That's www.cccentertainmentgroup.com. There, you can send us a message. And if you're an artist or creative or just want to get on the show and start talking about a bunch of shit like we do, please reach out to us and let us know. We'd love to have you. And uh, if you also need other realms to find us in, in this wonderful Silicon Valley of what we call social media, we're also on Facebook, Instagram. Twitter. You can find us all there. And we have a page on YouTube that we're just getting started as well. And also, if you do want to watch our feature film, you can find that on Amazon Prime right now. That movie is called The Outrider. It's our first major feature film that we did. We have a bunch more coming, but please watch that one. Let us know what you think. And anyway, thanks again, guys, for tuning in. we got more shorts coming for you, so talk to you soon.